Today we're going to talk about Illumina DNA prep with enrichment introduction. So if this name is relatively new, formally named in Nixera Flex for enrichment. So these two are identical. They are exactly the same reagent. It's just a name change so that we will be able to read out the name um, more self-explanatory that know that this is a DNA prep and this is for enrichment and this is a product for targeted sequencing. So on the agenda today, um, we will be starting talking about, covering a little bit about what targeted sequencing and enrichment-based assays are. And then we move into, look at some of the features that Illumina DNA prep with enrichment offers. In the next step, we'll move into the specific library preparation protocol, as well as the enrichment process for this workflow. We'll also cover the sequencing considerations and options for analysis. In the last part, we'll take a look at the different key configurations so that we can best plan the experiment with the number of samples that we have in mind. So let's get started with talking about targeted sequencing and enrichment-based assays. So targeted sequencing is referred to a strategy that we can sequence a subset of genes or regions of the genome. So this is in contrary to whole genome sequencing or WGS. So in WGS, we will prep the entire genomic DNA into a library and sequence it as a whole. In targeted sequencing, only a portion of the genomic DNA will be sequenced. If we have a subset of genes or regions that we are particularly interested in, then using targeted sequencing really saves us uh, sequencing time expenses and focus on the data analysis part that will be um, that will be focused on the regions of our prime interest. Typically, there are two different approaches for targeted sequencing, and they can be based either on amplicon or an enrichment assay. In an amplicon assay, usually the approach involves a designing a primer set and that would surround or target the regions of our interest. We generate an amplicon, then add on the sequencing adapters for the library preparation. In the enrichment-based assay, usually we start prepping a whole genome sequencing library, so a library that would contain all of the genomic DNA. Then we will hybridize in this library with probes that are designed to target the regions of our interest. Then we pull down this specific probe, which would also bring down the DNA fragments and covering the regions of our interest. We elute that DNA fragments and usually um, use an amplification step to amplify that, and that would be our final library for sequencing. So targeted sequencing is being applied in many different areas, and here are some of the examples. So such as like whole exome sequencing, if we are interested in the coding sequence. And in collagen and cancer research, a lot of times we use a fixed panel that would target a hotspot genes. Um, and sometimes if we're particularly interested in a very specific set of genes, such as those may be involved in genetic diseases, then we can design custom panels to target those regions for sequencing. So using amplicon-based assay has the benefit of using um, very, very little input material, and a lot of times are compatible with degraded DNA, such as those coming from um, the formalin fixed and paraffin embedded tissues, or FFP tissues. The Amplicon workflow is usually very fast, so it has a very short turnaround time, and generate libraries with a pretty high on target rate. What that means is that the library fragments that are generated by the primer sets will be highly specific. So we'll be sequencing those library fragments primarily from those regions that we are trying to target. Because of the chemistry amplicon of designing specific sets of primers surrounding the regions or the variants that we're particularly interested, amplicon approach is particularly useful for well-defined variant detection. Now on enrichment, on the other hand, the enrichment process um, usually involved a prep of a library and then an enrichment or hybridization process. So it does have a longer and more complex workflow. And historically, a lot of that would also in in involve the use of or the requirement of a high quality genomic DNA as input material. However, because of the chemistry enrichment that a specific region will be targeted by multiple different probes, it is known to provide 
better coverage uniformity in the sequencing data. And also because of the fact that we are not targeting specific region, that we are using probe to target a, an area, that it has the exploratory um, feature or the advantage of detecting both defined and novel variants in, in the regions of, um, that we are targeting. So using enrichment-based targeted sequencing really does have a lot of benefits. Um, in, in the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment, we do have some of the features that can help address some of the technical challenges, such as the workflow complexity and also the input DNA requirement. So here is a slide that summarizes some of the key features for the DNA for the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment. So first of all, this is actually a very fast workflow. It's a lot faster than um, some of our legacy enrichment workflow. For prepping 12 samples, usually uh, uh, the hands-on time is about two hours, and then the entire turnaround time is about six and a half hours. This workflow also is compatible with many different sample input types, including DNA from FFP tissues, as well as high quality genomic DNA and a direct input of blood and saliva samples. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the following slides. The Illumina DNA prep with enrichment workflow also has a very nice and added features in terms of normalizing input and also the output library that can help us minimize the effort in terms of quantification and normalization before the library prep and also going into the enrichment. We'll talk about that in the next slide about this particular feature. So this particular workflow also is a, um, an open workflow that is panel agnostic. What that means is that the workflow will work with Illumina fixed um, panels and Illumina custom panels, and it can also work with third-party pro panels for the enrichment or the hybridization process, as long as they fulfill certain technical requirements. For the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment, we also offer a complete solution from sample to analysis. Um, so we have uh, a couple of different options for analyzing the data, for aligning um, the sequencing data to the reference and call out um, the variants, and we can also use the variant interpreter to annotate and report out those variants. The reagents for Illumina DNA prep with enrichment is also automation friendly, and we have um, Illumina qualified automation scripts that are available through our automation partners. If we're interested in automating this workflow, definitely visit the website on the lower left hand side for more information. So this is a workflow overview of the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment. As you can see on the left-hand side, that is the library prep process. And then on the right-hand side, that is the enrichment, or sometimes it's called the hybridization process. So the, the workflow is very short, has a very short turnaround time. It is because of really simple three-step library preparation and a single step of hybridization capture and wash step so that we can elute out the DNA fragments for the final amplification. In the library preparation process here, the three step involved a fragmentation, which is a transbosome based fragmentation of the genomic DNA, which simultaneously inserts partial text into our DNA input, which is used as the priming site for our indexing PCR, which is the uh, last step of the library preparation. So after we PCR amplified the library and clean them up, this library will be ready for the enrichment process. I would like to point out that there is a specific technology that we're using here that is called the Beatling Transposome or BLT. So the Beatling Transposome is really referring to the transposomes are linked to beads. So when we linked in the transposomes to bees, and there is a specific feature of this reagent, which is there is a saturation point for these BLT, or specifically for Illumina DNA prep with enrichment, the transposome, beetling transposomes that we're using are called enrichment BLT or EBLT.
And the specific saturation point on EBLT is 50 nanogram of high quality genomic DNA. When we input higher than 50 nanogram of high quality genomic DNA, all of the transposomes on the beads will be saturated. What that means is that when the beads are saturated, and there will be a normalized of input amount that going into our following library preparation step that would help us minimize the um, effort involved in terms of quantifying each, um, each sample input and normalizing them to a specific input amount. And that also means that after the library preparation, we also expect consistent library yields because of this normalizing effect. And thus, a library quantification going into the enrichment is not required. If we are using um, lower than 50 nanogram of high quality genomic DNA or degraded genomic DNA, then the transposomes would not be completely saturated. So we do expect variable library yield and then the library quantification will be required. There are four different input types and that we have verified internally that are compatible with the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment. So first of all would be high quality genomic DNA input between 10 to 1000 nanogram. And again, for higher than 50 nanogram but input, we do expect that input normalization and specifically for, for large and complex genomes, such as human genome, we do recommend using a minimum of 50 nanogram of DNA to ensure the, the input complexity. This workflow can also work with direct blood and saliva lysis following the specific lysis protocol. For blood lysis, a protocol that is provided in the Appendix A of the Reference Guide of Illumina DNA Prep with Enrichment, for using blood as a direct input, it also requires an optional, uh, actually for blood, it would be a required um, flex lysis reagent to use in the blood lysis protocol. And we'll use 10 microliters of fresh blood collected in the EGTA collection tubes. Um, if we're using the blood lysis protocol, that extracted DNA is also expected to saturate the EBLT and normalize the input. A similar situation applied to saliva samples as well. Um, but for saliva samples, there is no uh, additional required uh, consumable. We can just follow the saliva lysis protocol in the Appendix A of the reference guide. Um, we will be using 30 microliters of saliva collected in orogene DNA saliva collection tube. And again, the input normalization is, in, uh, is expected. Um, the particular workflow is also compatible with de degraded DNA inputs such as those collected or extracted from FFPE tissues. For that, we do recommend performing a qualification step using the Infinium FFPE QC kit. And the recommendation is that we want to make sure that the delta CQ value is um, lower or equal to five to ensure a certain quality of the FFPE DNA would be compatible with the workflow for optimal um, downstream analysis. For FFPE tissues or FFPE DNA, we also recommend a minimum of 50 nanogram as input, um, and that extraction can be performed with the Kyogen All Prep DNA RNA FFPE kit. Um, the input normalization, because this is a degraded input, that we don't expect the normalization or the saturation of the transposomes would take place. So we do recommend the quantification for FFPE DNA into the library prep and also into um, the uh, enrichment if we want to use a certain amount of DNA library. So the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment is based on transposome segmentation, as we just talked about. So there will be certain uh, in input purity to ensure the success of the library preparation. And overall, we can assess um, the contaminant content by using a, by looking over the 260 over 280 and the 260 over 230 ratios, and that is provided in the reference guide as well. And the general recommendation is that we want to make sure that there are no inhibitors that can coat the DNA, which will prevent or uh, prevent the excess of transposome and the tagmentation. We also want to make sure the DNA is free of uh, um, inhibitors that may inhibit, denature, or degrade enzyme. 
So overall, the rules that are used in the Nextera XT library preparation apply, and we can refer to the Nextera XT library prep tips and troubleshooting guide for more information. Now, after we prepare the library, we're ready to go into the enrichment and hybridization process. And this workflow is compatible with a array of different um, panel options, including those coming from Illumina, such as the Illumina fixed and custom panels. And the custom panels can be designed on our Illumina designed uh, console on the design studio. If we are interested in using third party pro panel, um, then we do have a few different criteria that uh, we have tested internally. So if we are using DNA biotinylated probes that we've tested that the probes would be either 80 or 120 base pairs long between 500 to 675,000 probes. And these probe panel can be either single or double stranded and the requirement to go into the enrichment, it will be a minimum of three picomoles. If we are using RNA biotinylated probe set, we've tested these probe sets at 120 base pair long, and the probe uh, panel would be between 300,000 to 675,000 probe sizes. And they will be single stranded, and again, the minimum input into the hybridization would be three picomoles. So using Illumina panels or the third panel um, pro oligo, can be, are also really straightforward following the Illumina DNA probe enrichment. If we're using any um, Illumina oligo probe panels, then we can just directly follow the reference guide. If we're using the third party panels here, first we want to make sure we confirm with the panel requirements or the criteria we just talked about. If we're using DNA probe panel, we can follow the reference guide. If we're using the RNA probe panel, uh, we recommend following the, the Nextera Flex for Enrichment with the RNA probes demonstrated protocol. So again, the Nextera Flex for Enrichment is the exact same reagent kit um, as the DNA, as the Illumina DNA probe enrichment, just with the name change. So with that, we let's go into the specific library preparation step and see how this library is performed. We'll start again with the library preparation. And the library preparation here is just a quick uh, walk, walk through of the chemistry. It was started with tagmentation, which insert partial text into our genomic DNA, which is used as the priming site for indexing PCR to add on the full adapters. So in the very first step, we will be combined the DNA in 30 microliters of volume with the EBL TBs and TB1 buffer and incubate at 55 degrees for five minutes and then move into a 10 degrees hold. So this is actually a critical step in the library preparation process because it determines whether the success of the following steps. So there is a one particular critical reagent here that is the EBLT enrichment beat link transosome. We want to make sure that we're bringing the EBLT up to room temperature before use and make sure that it's fully resuspended. And this EBLTB, they are very sensitive to dry condition. So make sure in storage that the EBLT are standing upright so that all of the bees are submerged in buffer. So when we move on to the next step, we also want to make sure that the uh, tagmentation program reaches the 10 degrees Celsius before we move it to add on to the stop uh, reaction buffer and incubate five minutes at room temperature. And step two in the library preparation, we are cleaning up the EBLT so that we can go into the indexing PCR. There are three steps of washes using the Tagman wash buffer TWB. And when we are at the third step of the wash, we want to make sure that we leave the EBLT beads in the TWBs to prevent drying when we're setting up the indexing PCR. So specifically, um, again, going back to the dry condition for the EBLT, and we will absolutely want to um, avoid that. And if we're preparing a lot of samples, such as uh, higher than 48 samples, we do recommend using a one to two column increment when we're doing the washing step so that, that we can make sure that the beads are always in the wet condition and not being dried out. So after we wash um, the EBLT, then we can 
uh, move the EBLT directly into the indexing PCR step. So we will mix the EBLT with uh, the um, EPM and water and also using our um, DNA RNA unique dual indexes adapters for the amplification. So depending on the input type and the input amount that we are using, there are different numbers of recommended cycle of amplification. Definitely result, uh, consult in the reference guide for that information. And specifically here, we are using uh, unique dual indexes that are tested and verified with the Illumina DNA prep or with enrichment. So these indexes are actually um, provided in 9612 plates. We want to make sure that we centrifuge the plates after we saw it out and we can pierce the foil on top of that particular index, uh, index plate with a clean tip and then use a fresh tip to transfer the index to combine with in the PCR reaction. If we are prepping a lot of samples, such as the entire plate or 96 samples, then we can use a fresh 96 well plate to pierce the foil and then trans start transferring those indexes for the PCR amplification. So these unique dual indexes, the folding for them is IDT for Illumina, DNA, RNA, UD indexes. And specifically, they are a little different from our traditional indexes. They are all contain the 10 base pairs of indexes for both I5 and I7. And each well is designed for a single use to prevent any sort of contamination. If for uh, you know, sequencing consideration, if we're pulling few samples um, for sequencing, the recommendation there is that we will use a column-based uh, pulling, and the specific instructions can be, can be found in the index adapter pulling guide. So after the uh, indexing PCR, we'll move into cleaning up that library so that we are ready for the hybridization step. So in the cleanup step here, uh, we will use the Ampere XPB to clean up the uh, amplified library, and the library will be eluded in 15 microliters of resist management buffer, or RSB. This cleanup step also is a size selection step, and the correct handling of this step would determine the yield of our library. So it is a critical step. So I have some best practices for the Ampere XPB here, so make sure that we follow them. And also, there are two different protocols for this um, cleanup step or specific sections in the reference guide. So We've, we are working with high quality genomic DNA input, including the blood and saliva samples. We will be performing a two step cleanup. The two step cleanup here, the very first step, we remove the large fragment, and we want to make sure that we are adding the water and beads separately into each well of the sample. And that would help us um, best control the ratios of the beads to the sample. And then in the second step there, we're removing the small fragments. So after we transfer the supernatant from the very first step, we add more beads. And at this time, the library fragments are captured on the beads. We will remove the supernatant and elude the library from the beads. If we are working with DNA that are extracted from FAP or any degraded DNA, we want to use a single step of cleanup that will remove the small fragments only. Um, here, there, we also have an optional QC step. If we would like to perform that QC step at a later stage, we can save that one microliter off in the library and combine with four microliters or RSB and store it at minus 20. So before we go into a little bit more about the QC step, let's take a closer look at that specific um, size selection so that we make sure that that will be performed correctly. So for high quality input, we are performing a two step of cleanup step. So the very first step, we're adding water and we're also adding beads. And this particular practice would capture the large fragments on the beads. So our library fragments are actually in the supernatant. We then transfer the supernatant into a separate tube, add on more beads, and at this time, the library fragments of that we need will be bound on the beads and the small fragments remain in the supernatant. So we will remove the and discard the supernatant 
wash the bead and then elude it into the final RSV buffer, and that will be our final library. If we are performing um, with FFP input, we're only performing the second step of this procedure here, where we are adding as the MP or XP beads and combined with our DNA library. The library fragments are captured in the beads, the small fragments in the supernatant, we remove and discard the supernatant, and so that we can elute our final library off the beads. So after that, we can perform that library QC, or we can perform that at a later time point. Um, in either case, we can run this run microliter of pre-enriched library on a bioanalyzer, and the libraries are expected to have a, about a 350 base pairs as the average size. If we are working with degraded DNA that's coming from FAP samples, this library can be a little bit small, and we have seen as small as the 250 base pairs, and that is expected. So overall, in the very first step of this library preparation here, that we want to make sure that we have expected and sufficient yield of the library to go into the enrichment step. And if we've been prepping the library for a while and notice and that we have a, a drop in terms of library yield, or overall we have a very minimal yield, minimum yield, um, this can derive from all four steps that we just talked about. So some of the best practices here that we want to make sure that we are handling the EBLTBs as recommended, make sure that it's stored upright and they are not dried out in any of the steps and when we are handling them. And for the amplification step, make sure that we are using the recommended number of cycles of amplification. And if we are working with FAP samples, note that there is a very specific step for the cleanup in the post-amplification cleanup step. So this slide is here, and then we can refer to it for um, some of the um, troubleshooting if we do happen to run into these situations. So in the next part, let's focus on more on the enrichment part or the hybridization part. And this will be on the right-hand side of the workflow overview here. So before we go into the enrichment, there is an optional pooling step for the pre-enriched libraries. What that means that is that we can combine more than one library into the enrichment, and that's what we call as pooled sample library. Then we go into the hybridization, and then followed by the capture and wash step, elution, and the final library amplification and cleanup. So specifically, in the step one, we can choose to pool the pre-enriched libraries together for the enrichment step. So the pooling recommendation will be um, depending on the sample input type and you know, also depending on the application, such as whether we want to perform germline variant calling or zomatic variant calling. And the enrichment plexity, so this is referring to the number of pre-enriched libraries in each re enrichment reaction. And what we have tested in-house here is either a single plex or a single library enrichment, or a 12 plex, meaning that we're pulling 12 libraries together. So other plexities may also be possible with testing, and we do have other customers running at, uh, you know, between the 1 plex and 12 plex. And that's something that can be attempted, um, but will likely require additional library, re, um, library prep reagents, which we can talk about in the um, reagent configuration section of this webinar. So the polling strategy here, uh, we do have two different strategies that can be used for the workflow. One is pull by volume, and the other one is pull by mass. What it means by pull by volume here is that we will not use any quantification step for the pre-enriched library, but we will pull equal volume to go into the hybridization. So for a single plex, and we only have a single library, we'll be moving the entire pre-enriched library, that is 14 microliters, into the following step. For the 12 plex enrichment here, they will be using 2.5 microliters per library and pull them together for the hybridization um, um, and the following capture and wash. Now, when we are pulling by mass, what that means is that we will perform a quantification step for the pre-enriched libraries, and we'll be using 500 nanograms per library, either for a one-plex 
or a 12-plex enrichment. Now let's take a closer look in terms of the conditions that we may consider or um, we plan for how we want to pull the libraries for the enrichment. So first of all, by volume that we are not doing any quantification. So for the multiplexing of a 12-plex, then this will be particularly, um, so this will be compatible with the input types and amount that we will be uh, achieving normalization or normalized library yield output. That includes high quality genomic DNA between 50 to 1000 nanogram of input or blood and saliva samples following the blood lysis protocol or the saliva lysis protocol. Now these input amount or input type can also use one plex uh, for enrichment. Then we're just moving the 14 microliters of library directly down to the downstream step. Now using a single plex can also be used with a lower input amount or degraded input amount that we are not saturating the EBLTB. Now in terms of application, uh, we tested using the 12-plex enrichment for a germline variant calling. And for somatic variant calling, we recommend using the 1-plex, which is the 14 microliters of library to go into enrichment. For pulling by mass, and that we will be quantifying the pre-enriched libraries, and the target here is the 500 nanogram of library going into the enrichment for both 12-plex or a single-plex. And this is actually for the 12-plex will be applicable to high quality genomic input, um, either from the 10 nanogram to all the way to 1,000 nanogram input, as well as the blood and saliva samples following the blood lysis protocol or the saliva lysis protocol. So these input types can also be used in a single plex. And for FFPE DNA, and we also recommend that go into the single plex for enrichment. Now, if we're working with high quality input and the 12 plex, um, we have tried and uh, tested that we may be able to use as little as 100 nanogram per library if we're performing germline variant calling. Now, if we're using one plex that is 500 nanogram per library, that particular setting will be compatible from both a somatic and a germline variant calling. Now, after we've determined how we would like to move forward in terms of the pooling step, we are ready to go into the hybridization. So in the hybridization step here, we'll be combining the DNA library with NHB2, the panel, and then the EHB1 buffer. If we are working with third-party panel, we want to check the criteria that we, all, uh, we, we talked about earlier and also follow the manufacturer's probe volume recommendation. If that volume is lower than 10 microliters, we can use RSB to fill it up to 10 microliters to go into the hybridization step. The hybridization will be performed on a thermocycler with a minimum uh, hold of 90 minutes to a maximum of 24 hours if we would like to split that workflow into two days. So after the hybridization step, we want to proceed immediately to the capture step. The hybridization step is also a critical step for the success of our enrichment, as you can imagine. So there is a critical reagent here that requires our specific attention in terms of handling, which is the NHB2 buffer. This buffer is blue capped and it can form precipitates and separate it um, when it's stored at minus 20. When we are thawing out this reagent, we want to make sure that we first thaw at room temperature, then heat it up to 50 degrees Celsius for five minutes. We want to make sure that we vortex and pipette the buffer really well from the bottom of the tube and make sure that the solution is completely clear before we add it to the DNA library. When we're setting up the hybridization reaction, we also want to make sure that the reaction is added in a very specific order and without mixing any of the reagents. And that order will be, we add NHB2 to the DNA library, then we add the panel, and then we add the EHB2. We do not recommend making a master mix of the two hybridization buffer here, because the mixing of the two buffers can um, form precipitates, and which will actually negatively impact the enrichment efficiency. So for the specific hybridization program, there are different conditions depending on the input type that we use. 
and also the panel type of our choice, and also the specific application for either germline or somatic variant calling. And all of this information is in the reference guide, so definitely consult the reference guide for the specific instructions. Now, if we are working with third-party panels, and we notice that we would like to further optimize the percent duplicates, then we can try increasing the hybridization time to longer than 90 minutes, so all the way to 16 hours without the change of the specific recipe of the hybridization. So while we are um, incubating or hybridizing uh, the probes to our library, we can also start preparing for the next step for, um, by thawing out the SMBBs and also heating up the wash bar for the EEW. So after the hybridization, we need to move quickly into our capture and wash step. So in this particular step, we will transfer all of our hybridization reaction to a meaty plate or an Eppendorf tube. And then we will add the strep avidin magnetic beads, the SMB beads, shake and incubate, and then we can start washing the beads. When we are washing the beads, we'll be using the preheated EEW wash buffer for three times. And each time there is an incubation time um, and period, a period of time on the microheating system. After we finish the three washes with EEW, we want to make sure that we are transferring that those bees into a new MIDI plate or a new Appendorf tube for the, uh, for the fourth wash, again, with the preheated EEW. After we complete all four washes, we are ready to elute the DNA from the bees using the elution mix uh, which will be a combination of EE1 buffer and HP3. Again, washing of these bees are very critical in terms of the success of the enrichment. So we emphasize um, on the different washes here, and also we want to point out that uh, this is we need to make sure that the capture and wash and the heating step must be uh, performed on a microheating system with a meaty plate or an Eppendorf tube. Um, we, cannot, uh, we cannot use a thermocycler for this particular step here because that the volume that the thermocycler can accommodate is too low. And we want to make sure that the correct volume is used so that the washing step is effective. When, if we're using a meaty plate for these steps here, we recommend using a shaker for the mixing step or we can use a vortex if we're using an Ampendorf tube for these particular steps. We do not recommend using a pipette motion, um, manually pipetting to um, wash or mix these steps because that can actually result in a hanging of the hybridization buffer on the wall of those tubes, which can inhibit the following PCR step. There are a total of four washes together. The very first three washes is they are they are performed in the same place or the same Eppendorf tube. And for the very last wash, we want to make sure that we're using a fresh plate or a fresh tube. Here, there are two different types of bees that are used in uh, used in the entire protocol. For the capture hybridized hybridized probes, we want to make sure that we are using the strep avidin magnetic bees, that's the SMBBs, so that we can capture the biotinuated probes. Um, the capture and wash incubation temperatures also vary by the sample type panel and application. Make sure that we consult the reference guide so that we can follow the correct instructions. So after we the elution uh, of the DNA library fragments here, then we can move into the amplification step using the reagents um, provided. And there are different amplification cycles recommended depending on the panel we use. And so we can go to the reference guide for that specific information. And after the amplification, then we will again use the Ampure XBB to clean up the enriched library and elute the library in RSD buffer. And that would actually complete of our entire library preparation. So for the final enriched library for all panels, all input types, we do expect that um, the, uh, the, the yield would be a minimum of three nanogram per microliter. And when we QC that on a bioanalyzer, the library size is very comparable for, uh, uh, as compared to the pre-enriched library 
which would be roughly about 350 base pairs as uh, average size. If we're working with degraded samples, again, that it may be a little bit smaller, and that is expected. So for the enrichment step here, um, a couple of undesirable you know, results that we may see were actually involved with the library, the final library yield. And if we are seeing um, unexpected low final library yield, it actually can be derived from the all four steps. Again, here, either the handling of the hybridization and capture, and specifically whether we are following best practices for handling FMB beads in these steps, and whether in during the amplification, whether we are using the recommended number of cycles, and also whether we are handling the MPRB as, uh, as we expect, can all contribute to the library yield. Now, if we are seeing some of the suboptimal results uh, after the sequencing, after the analysis, that are specifically to, related to the enrichment metrics, then a lot of that would be related to, to the handling or the steps in the hybridization or the capture step. So we want to make sure we want to, um, we are, we start out the NHB2 buffer as recommended and also with the temperature control on all of the instruments are calibrated if we're seeing um, some of the unexpected metrics from the sequen sequencing, uh, from the final analyze the sequencing data. All right, with that, so let's take a look at the different consideration for the sequencing and the analysis option that we have for the DNA, for the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment. So, First of all, uh, for this particular library size, the recommended width length here is two by 101 because we expect that the final library would be about 250 base pairs. So the insert size is about 200 base pairs. Now, if we are working with small panels uh, for enrichment, then a lot of times the bench, uh, the bench stuff systems would be uh, most suitable for the output requirement. If we are working with larger panels, such as like exome sequencing, then the high throughput platforms would likely to be more suitable for sequencing consideration. When we are setting up or planning the sequencing run, for setting up a sample sheet that is required for a certain instrument or for the demultiplexing, um, for that, the Illumina Experiment Manager is updated. So as long as we're using a version 1.16 or higher, then we'll be able to select from the pull-down menu for uh, formulating our sample sheet. The prep tab on base base is also updated with a specific index set and the workflow, and we can also choose from the pull-down menu. If we are running an instrument that uses Local Run Manager, the library prep kit definition files and sample sheet templates are available on the IDT for Illumina unique dual index support page, and I, I provided a link in the final um, resource uh, slide that you can click on and get access uh, to the specific uh, support page for this information. Now for pooling consideration, we can refer to the index adapter pooling guide for the index combination. And in our data sheet, we also have some specific recommendation in terms of how many samples to pull together for sequencing. If we're working with a custom panel and have a specific width depth in mind, we can always use the coverage calculator to estimate the number of samples that we can pull together for sequencing. Now for denature and dilution, we do have a table that's citing the starting and loading concentration recommendation per platform, and that is available in the reference guide. For run setup, the sequencing run will be 101, 10, and 10, and 101. And just pay attention that we are using the IDT for Illumina DNA RNA unique dual indexes that has 10 base pairs. So we want to make sure that the checkout is the index which will be 10 base pairs, not the traditional A base pairs indexes. Um, here is a screenshot for the starting concentration and the final loading concentration for this uh, library. The starting concentration is referring to um, the normalized concentration for our final library that we can start the denaturation. So uh, this is uh, available in the reference guide uh, at the end of the protocol, so definitely take a look there when we are planning on uh, loading onto the sequencer. So when we are setting up the sequencing run, we can choose uh, to stream the BCL files to base-based sequencing hub. The base-based sequencing hub there will um, 
will help us demultiplex the data and convert them into FASTQ files. And the FASTQ files will be available for the um, downstream analysis. And we recommend and verify the use of the enrichment app version 3.1 on the space sequencing hub. Um, for the uh, alignment and also uh, the identification of variants. We do have a couple other options for the analysis that are um, through the Dragon Enrichment app on base space um, sequencing hub or the DNA enrichment module on Local Run Manager. And we, we are interested in using any of these workflow and for more detailed information, definitely visit our recorded webinar, Enrichment Data Analysis Introduction, and you can access that by clicking um, that hyperlink on this slide here. So after the secondary analysis, and we will be able to use our variant interpreter software on base space, and that will provide a variant filtering and notation classification and also generate a report for, um, for the downstream for the reporting purpose. So here I would like to show you a few screenshots here showing you how we can run through the enrichment app of version 3.1 and look at a few different selections that we can make when we are launching the app for analysis. So on base base, once we find the enrichment app version 3.1, we can launch the application, and then we can select the project that we would like to save our enrichment analysis to, and define the biosamples, which will be the specific library that we would like to analyze for this particular project. And then on the lower part of the screen here, we'll be able to select the specific panels that we use. If we're using the Illumina 6 panels, then they are available on the pull-down menu. We can just select that. And the base padding here will be, by default, 150 base pairs. If we are using a custom um, pro panel or using a third-party pro panel, then we will choose the custom manifest in the targeted region which will allow us to upload that targeted manifest in the lower screen. If this is a panel that we designed through the Illumina Design Studio, the manifest can be downloaded from Design Studio and then uploaded to base space, which will allow us to choose that as the custom targeted manifest. So once the analysis completed, we will be able to see in the analysis results in the project, in the specific project that we saved in the result too. When we click on that particular project, we will see that the enrichment app that finished in the analysis. When we click on it, we'll be able to populate the, the results. So in the enrichment app, we provide the summary report would be, which will be a summary of all of the samples that we have analyzed and provide at the read level, base level, and target level enrichment metrics. We also have summary for the variance and coverage, as well as the analysis for fragment length and duplicate. Uh, similar metrics or the same metrics are also provided for each individual um, sample here. Um, here are a couple of screenshots that we will be able to see uh, you know, the small variance uh, summary in terms of the context and also by consequences. Um, we also provide the, a variant table in that particular um, enrichment app, and we will be able to do a quick sort if we have a particular um, interest in the type of variant. So for more detailed information, definitely visit that recorded webinar that I mentioned earlier, and you can access that through this hyperlink on the upper right corner. So in the last part of our um, webinar, let's take a look at the different reagent kit configuration and see how we can plan for our experiment. So the Illumina DNA prep with enrichment have a completely decoupled kit component. What that means is that we will have the library prep reagents and the other uh, reagents separated so that we have the flexibility in terms of pairing them together. On the library prep reagents, and we do have a bundle Illumina DNA prep with enrichment re, uh, reagents that we combine the library prep reagents as well as the enrichment reagents. We also have um, the library prep only reagent kit if we are using Plexity other than one or 12 plex for the enrichment. If we are working with FFPE samples, then 
well, we recommend using the Infinium FAP QC kit for qualifying the FAP input. If we are working or interested in using the direct blood um, as a input type into our workflow, then we recommend using the Flexalysis Reagent Kit. The indexes kit that are compatible with the workflow would be the IDT for Illumina DNA and RNA unique dual indexes that can be um, that can be chosen separately with the different sets of preference. And we also need to acquire the enrichment probe panel so that we can perform the hybridization. And these can, come in, can be coming from Illumina or from third parties. And here is the specific configuration of the reagent kit. So these will be, this is a table for the necessary reagents that are required to complete in the library preparation. So we have an Illumina DNA prep with enrichment for 16 or 96 samples, specifically the 16 samples, and they are bundled and in the specific configuration for a single plex enrichment. And the 96 sample kit is for 96 samples in the configuration of a 12 plex enrichment. We do have four different sets of indexes available, and we can just choose one to pull up to 96 samples together. If we are pulling more than 96 samples, then we will need to acquire more than one index kit to allow that pooling. So a pro panel is also required for the enrichment, and a pro panel selection for Illumina, including a few different fixed panels and listed here, uh, with the configuration in terms of how many enrichment reactions that those pro panels support. For the Illumina custom enrichment panel, that is a custom design on Design Studio. So in terms of accessory reagents, um, we have the library prep reagents only reagents that is for 16 samples or the 96 samples. And here also the Infinium FAP QC kit for qualification and the Flex Lysis reagent kit for using direct blood um, lysis as input. Um, we also have an accessory uh, item here as uh, the Illumina adapter blocking reagent for ensuring uh, the maximum amount of data uh, for demultiplexing. Uh, a specific note for the reagents for Illumina DNA prep with enrichment is that all of these reagents will be shipped at, uh, at four degree. So the reagents are tested and configured in a way that they would allow it to be shipped at four degree. And once we receive it, we, we just need to look at the specific storage condition and move them to uh, the uh, optimal long-term storage condition. As you using a four degree shipment can really help us reduce the use of dry eyes. And specifically, there are three different boxes that we need to pay attention to. One is the buffer um, box um, that needs to be stored at room temperature, and two PCR reagent box. Uh, and then for the enrichment, we also include the buffers need to be stored at uh, minus 20. And here is a list of different equipment and consumables, depending on the workflow. And we also have a separate document um, that for easy printout, and then we can check before we plan the experiment. And this is my last slide with some of the useful resources. So we have uh, a product page that introduced and includes a lot of useful information of this library prep workflow. And we also have a support page that includes um, that RNA probe demonstrated protocol that we can get access to. We have a couple of web-based training as well, and one is for designing custom enrichment panels on Design Studio, and also best practices in troubleshooting for Illumina DNA prep with enrichment is a really short 20 minutes video. Um, we also have the Illumina um, DNA RNA UD indexes support page that includes the index adapter pooling guide that has the index plate layout, and also the adapter sequences document if we'd like to take a look at the index sequences, as well as the definition files in the sample sheets and template download. Other documents and tools that may be useful include um, the Nextera XT library prep tips and troubleshooting guide, um, and also have a coverage calculator for calculating the number of samples that we can pull together for sequencing, um, and last but not least, and the recorded webinar for enrichment data analysis. I will end here, and I'm happy to take any questions.